Chinese. So what is the appendicular system? Limbs, right. Arms and legs. You know, yeah. we did axial last week, which is our ascended skeletal system, which is the system of the skull, the vertebrae, sacrum, pockets, rear, sternum. This is everything else. So on the upper extremity, we've got scapular, clavicle, humerus, radius, ulna, carpals, metacarpals, phalanges, the lower extremity, pelvic. What's the proper name for pelvic bone? Ooh, another thing. Oscoxal or nominative bone. Oscoxal, O S C O X A L, is the proper name, even though we call it pelvic bone, you know, <laughs> or iliac bone. You know, iliac is one part of this. So, why is the bone marking so important on this? Well, one of the students here is doing kinesiology is seeing that's for origin and insertion of muscle. That's why it's there. It's, a, it's to create this lever system to move these joints, to move the bones. So we work on a lever system just like a crane does. You know, we don't get into the, the three types of levers. I don't get into that anymore. It's complicated. Come to physical therapy, you'll get into it. But here we don't need it. The schools are becoming nurses, so you don't really need to know lever systems. But the bone markings play a big, important role. That's why you learn spinous process, transverse process, tubercle, trochanter. They have a reason, you know, because something's got a hook to it. So just, that's what you, you remember. They, and then we've got gullies and crevices because that means another part of the bone has to go into it. So a process might go into a fossil. You know, it's electronon process, electronon fossil. It has to, a notch to fit another bone so to create a joint space. So that's why we have all this terminology. It's not just a torching, right? And, you know, where we talk a lot about facets in this time, now you're going to hear more about conduct, more rounded surfaces for bone versus flat surfaces. Okay? So, this one's over here. An example would be the scapula. This is a right scapula because it points the direction it's going. Right. For the left, this would be going this way. So it's so easy to figure it out when you just look at it because it points towards where it's going, the right. That means right shoulder, left shoulder. So it's as simple as that. Don't make it so damn difficult. When you're looking at a posterior view or a dorsal view, okay, there's your inferior aspect, superior, medial, lateral. And in the front would be the ventral, the ventral view of, of this bone. We'll get to it within a few minutes. It doesn't really have much on it other than a fossa. So we have the spine. So we have a fossa above the spine. We call it supraspinous fossa, infraspinous fossa. And when you get to the muscles, they're going to be named the same way, supraspinatus, infraspinatus. So as you start learning these bone marks, it's going to help you out with muscles. Like the muscles are named by what they do, their shape, what they hook to. I mean, that's how you name muscles, okay? This ends with the acromion process, which is this idea. The most lateral aspect of your body is the acromion process. There it is. In the front, we have the coracoid process. That's like here on you. So you have the, you know, the, the curricular fossa, infracurricular fossa on your body. You can stand over the push on this. You know, why is that thing tender when you touch it? Well, it doesn't have bursts over it. And what else? A lot of tendon attachment. Such as pec minor. Break, uh, corical brachialis. One of the heads of the biceps. Hook on this thing. Okay, so that's why. So we're going to go back to this again in a few minutes. So show you that. Now let's go looking at a pelvis. So we're looking at the sacral base. The sacral kind of like gets wedged right between the two pelvic bones to create your own pelvic basin. And on here we have this thing called the pelvic rim, which to look at a whole pelvis and label it, you're responsible for that in a practical too. So in terms like pelvic rim, um, the, uh, the pubic symphysis, sacroiliac joint, responsible for all that even on the practical. Because you'll have whole pelvises 
It's also responsible for the difference between a male and a female pelvis. It's page 78 to 79 in your lab books. It's also in your textbook. So tomorrow you'll see, you know, in a second we're going to go into the difference between a male and a female pelvis. And, you know, there's certain things you look at, the arch, how oval this is shaped. So it's more female looking pelvis than male. More designed to hold, you know, a baby than the male pelvis would be. But it's a coxal bone, ox, cox, a, or a co there's its proper name, or hip bone. I hate the hip. You call it pelvic bone on the test. You would tell me right pelvis, left pelvis. You would not tell me hip. Hip is too late, term. There's more there than a hip. Understand? So just make sure you keep that in your head. So it's just this rim, and this rim, and we'll show you a little later as we go along the slide, has a significance and importance. What I want you to realize though, three bones merge together to make this bone. The ilium, the pubes, and the issue all come together to create this. And then we have a foramen there called obturator foramen. See that? The big hole that we see in our pelvis. What do you think goes through that? Obturator nerve. Feeds the medial thigh. L2 to L4 innervation. You'll learn that in a few weeks when we do nerves of the lower extremity. <coughs> so when we get into muscles here, we brief the muscles of how they work, generalized function. Then and we just generalize, or when we get into nerves again, then we go back to muscles and talk about each one that's innervated. And then you worry about origin and insertion of the muscles. We generalize it, though. You don't have to tell me specific. You get asked questions, what muscles would originate off the scapula? What muscles insert to the scapula? So you get scapula sling muscles versus muscles that would move the upper extremity would have to come off the scapula to do that. So you just got to think about it. To move this, they're going to start up here to move this. To move this, they're going to start here to bring this up and so forth. Okay? So that's how it will work. But these landmarks are very important. Um, so just remember, three bones unite to create this. And why symphysial surface means where it's going to make the pubic symphysis. So you can't say pubic symphysis if you don't have a complete pelvis. You can say symphysial surface. And then we have pubic tubercle. And the ASIS right here. This is an important landmark because when you connect the line between the two, you create what you want to see when you get into the muscle, the inguinal ligament and the inguinal canal. The canal plays a big role in the male, not the female, because she doesn't have to worry about the testes descending down into the scrotal sac. That's how it gets there, through that canal. <coughs> but in, in the male, it's more common to have hernia there because it stays open. Female, it closes, it becomes more ligament like, and the male stays a canal. Also, it's a landmark that when you cross that thing, you're no longer in the pelvis, you're not on the lower extremity. So, these things are all landmarks to use as guides. And that will help you when we do vascular, because you're going to have the external iliac artery, <coughs> external iliac vein. When they cross that, then it'll become femoral artery, femoral vein. So, they're landmarks. And they're clinical landmarks for you. To know where you are. Two of those is a bone. Okay. Um, the thing that testing is sensitive, what's that called? Inguinal canal. Inguinal, I-N-G-U. Don't, you know, we're going to go into that in detail. We'll get too hung up on that yet. It's just to give you an idea of why these two bony landmarks are important, because they're going to come back and haunt you when we get into when we talk about muscles, and when we talk about reproductive system, those landmarks will get mentioned again at the end of the semester. So you may get asked, where does you know, the inguinal canal originally hook on to on the pelvis bone? And there you go. So in other words, the course itself is cumulative in its design. You don't have to write cumulative tests. So what's the difference between the upper and lower limbs? What's the major difference? I mean, what are the differences between them? The lower limbs are stronger bones. They're stronger bones, so they're designed to do what? Yeah. Weight bearing. So the lower limb is designed for weight bearing, the upper limb is designed for lifting and fine manipulative movements. You can't do it like this with your feet. 
Some people can. They have nice long toes. Who is that? Who? There's a famous, I forget his name, he's a Spanish descendant, he's a famous musician, singer, and he was born with no arms. He plays the guitar with his feet. And you would never, by listening to him play, you would never think he's playing this instrument with his feet. That's how great he is. So, you know. Uh, yeah, it's hard with your hands, don't run with your feet. <laughs> You know, so it's, so you can train limbs to change if you have to, but in general, you know this is for the fine manipulative movements and lifting, and this is for weight bearing. So they're much bigger, stronger bones when you look at them. And then we'll get into comparison of the male and female pelvis. So first, we'll just generalize through the upper extremity. So there's your sling area on the shoulder, showing the scapula, clavicle, and uh, upper the upper part, the brachium. <clears throat> okay, which does have a lot of strength in it for lifting and pushing your body if it had to, pulling your body up. You know, but you're really not designed to walk on your hands. We're not designed to stand on our head because really C1 and the condyles of the skull really aren't that strong to support that. And what people do is stand on their head and they spin around and so you see dancers do that. Really isn't recommended. If they get older in life, I'm sure they're gonna have severe degeneration of those joints. Then we get into, you know, the forearm area, down to the hand, you know, and you can see everything is set up. If you take evolution, everything, fish, bird, you know, reptile, set up that you have one large bone, two small bones, and a bunch of little bones. It's even in, in the fins of the fish, and the wings of the bird. Everything is set up this way. And there's an evolu evolutionary anatomist from Harvard that presented this material and it was really fun. One day I was bored just flicking the TV like to do and I caught it and I said, let's see what you get to say. It was an anatomist thing. Now why in this picture we're showing this without a safety? Why are you think? Right. It's not part of the it's not part of the axial system. So I mean it's one's axial, one's appendicular. This is our appendicular system. It's not that like this person was born without a state. It's for his blood. You know, but this is this is showing you, see so your coxal bone, you know, and designed to transfer a weight that we talked about with the spongy bone set up and so forth. And then you go into the knee. So it's no weight bearing design. So now we compare the female to the male pelvis. <coughs> okay? So what pelvis is Bruce and which one is Kate? <laughs> no answer for it. Which one is Bruce and which one is Kate? Well, they're both on the right. Pelvis don't change, you know, so you can change your sex, but unfortunately the pelvic bone is going to stay looking the way it is when you do an x-ray on it. So that's going to be a giveaway on you if you have x-rays. You know, she was once a he. You know? <laughs> so there it is. So <clears throat> look at the difference in height between the female. The more bowl shaped. Why? We have to support a baby. It's not going to support a baby, it's going to support a lot of muscle mass. This is going to support a baby. So the male pelvis is more upright, upright, sharp angles, not broad angles like a female. Okay? Not in this nice wide pelvic brim versus a narrow pelvic brim. So there's a camera just right there. In case you find a pelvis in the woods someday, you can tell if it's male or female. They've solved many cases by just finding a pelvic bone. You know, when the female tested out how old the female probably was and stuff, you know, they solved the murder case years ago. But just finding a finding pelvis is a good job, a good job, you can do it. Then we take a lateral view. And look at the angle changes. Feet are much wider from here between the sacrum and the pelvis compared to the male sacrum to the pelvis. It's more erect in the male. 
difference in the shape. You know, usually male has more weight mass on the female. And then look from the on the outlets. <clears throat> nice wide oval shape versus cardiac shape for male. Much harder to push your baby out of the dance though than on the female. That's why we don't push babies. Like. What about when like, people are born with like both sex? Yeah, what? The pelvic bone would probably favor more of what the sex should have been. Okay, so you're talking about hermaphrodites. Yeah. Like Jamie Lee Curtis, she's an hermaphrodite. Really? Yes. None of her children are hers. They're adopted. We're looking at the master today, right? See what? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's like my age, I guess, but I mean, when I was a kid, she made all those 5 to 13 movies. I was like, wow, she's pretty good. So she was more female, you know, so it was easy. And mainly where I'm at, like, it was a mild case where it would just make her that she wouldn't be able to bear kids. But the ovaries probably didn't develop properly. It really wasn't. But some could be born with both genitalia. One will feed one testicles. You want to date with yourself? Date it right there. So, better be nice to myself so I get lucky tonight. <laughs> Super Valentine's. Where do you want to go? I don't know. Where, where, on the first date. Right? The weekend of love's coming up. All the, you know, all Hallmark. Every day you like to treat your work or your spouse good, not just on Valentine's. It's usually candy. It is. Well, it's always good to choose your candy. You know, drink and eat candy. Come on, man. Well, no, it's nice. You have these things. It gives you something to look forward to. So you can see the major differences. There are differences in the skull, but they're not as, you know, the female head a little more rounded, the males is more square shaped. So we're going to get into that. So you can tell off a skull, you can tell off, off a, a pelvis that there's a difference. Then we get into this thing, the pelvic brim. Why is it significant with that accurate line? Now, it's amazing. They call this accurate line. That's its name. You don't need to know that. But on an x-ray, it's called colus teardrop, because it looks like a teardrop. You take an x-ray out of it. And if the colus teardrops are obliterated, that means I have a metastasis in the pelvic area that's going in and hit the bone which is common in ovarian and prostatic cancer. That's what I'm migrating to. They love to migrate into here, boom, right into this area. And then they don't migrate like a female to, to the breast tissue. But it likes to hit the spine. It's easy for them. So it's a good source of absorption into it. Then once it gets there, now we can get into the marrow and spread it everywhere in the body. But that true and false pelvis, why is this so significant to know the difference between true and the false pelvis? Well, it's a, this is a boundary line, my pelvic rim, to tell me that if an organ sits here, it's truly a pelvic organ. If an organ sits here, even though it's near the pelvis, it's an abdominal organ. So there's a, there's a separation of abdomen from the pelvis is the pelvic rim. So keep that in your mind for when we get into the pelvic muscles, when we do reproduction in, in urinary, that the pelvic diaphragm is not your borderline. Pelvic diaphragm is designed to keep your, you know, bladder and and the uterus from falling in the toilet when you go to the bathroom. That's why it's there. It happens to a lot of older females. Years ago, just when they had like ten kids, they go, to, you know, go to the bathroom. There's everything hanging out in the toilet. It's like, whoa, I wonder why I was so glued to the bathroom. <laughs> The bearing down just tears the ligament structure away and weakens that diaphragm. So when you do all this cattle exercises, you're strengthening that diaphragm and the urogenital diaphragm. That's what you're working with when you practice that. The childhood and class. And some of you can give and so forth. Skip this for now, we'll come back to it. So <clears throat> we'll start taking a look at our appendicular system. So first of all, we have the clavicle. The clavicle is the one that probes students all the time when you ask questions on actual versus perpendicular. For some reason, you just have a feeling 
It should be with the axial system. Because it's just there to ribs. What the hell? But it really does. Its job is to work shoulder movement. Not spinal movement, shoulder movement. So how many have heard of AC separations? So what is an AC separation? Separation of the uh, 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 Right, so the separation right here. It pops. Person falls like this, pops. They dis but they didn't dislocate the humerus, they popped the AC joint. Happens a lot to athletes, they fall the wrong way when they're getting tackled, boom, hockey players, so forth. There it goes, they pop the AC joint. Pops gaps wider than the width of a finger, then it's going to be pinned back. That's the point of liquid toe, they're going to start to be pinned. So in a case like this, you know, and what you would do to see this on someone, because you might be pumping and you don't really find it. They stress the joint when they x ray. X ray it normal, then put 10 pound weight in the arm to stress the joint down, and you'll see this thing open. So that's why they'll put like a weight bag in the person's hand to pull it down. And then you can see if this joint's going to separate and stress. So we have a joint here, then we have a joint here. Sternoclavicular joint, right? Sternal end, sternoclavicular joint. Students of the past, look at the model going by. Own physiology now, that'll be you guys in the fall. So you can make faces in the room as you walk by. This is right there. So here we go. So we have one, two, three joints. We have four. Because see where the scapula meets the ribs? We have the costal scapula too. So there's four joints to a shoulder, not one. So when you have shoulder involvement of injury, there's a lot to rehab. It's a tough joint to rehab. Shoulder is one of the hardest joints to rehab. And it so, relies so much on muscle for its support. Not just ligament structure, muscle. The knee has a lot of ligament support. So you can surgically fix it right away. This is tough. You know, so it does have a lot of support of muscle to keep this joint stable. So that's why it's a tough joint to rehab. It really is. I never this refer all the way too much work. And then on the street, the physical therapist, and then we have. And find what's wrong with it, good. That's what you need. See in like six weeks to see if you got whatever. But it's a real tough joint to work with. And it's painful. Painful joint to rehab. <coughs> Go surgery. Talk to anybody who's had rotator cuff surgery. They're in agony for the first week or two after the surgery. Pain is 100 times worse than before the surgery. But then once they rehab and start moving it, then they're fine. So just to show you that about it. And here's the clavicle itself. You don't have to tell me right on that clavicle. You just have to tell me the clavicular and the sternal. I mean, the chromial and the sternal. Okay? That's all you need to know off the clavicle. You see that on the Now we go, this is the anterior view of your scapula. So we just have one big fossa in the front called the subscapular fossa, because it's underneath it. And again, there's my coracoid process, my glenoid cavity. So there you go. Where would be here? A muscle called subscapularis, which internally raises the arm. Part of the rotator cuff. Because you have four the sits muscle. It's like the yeah, sits. Let me say the other one. It says sits. There's no H in there. There's no one to do. And then this is looking at it from the lateral view. Showing a nice glenoid, coracoid, bone. Kind of a weird shape looking bone, isn't it? Isn't that kind of a regular look when you look at that? It's flat plus a regular bone. And now a long bone. A long bone is the humerus. And there's nothing funny about this bone. And that's your funny bone, right? That's your funny bone. We love it. There's nothing funny when you bang it. It's not like it tickles. When you bang it, oh, you start laughing. No, you just start cursing. You know, why is it hurt so much? Because you smash right out of the yellow nerve. The yellow nerve wraps right around this thing as it comes down. It wraps around and it goes down to take care of all this medial aspect of your forearm, medial anterior surface. And it goes right down to your pinky and half your ring finger. That's all the, all the nerve. You learn that, CAT1. But there it is. 
And you can tap here, and you can actually elicit tingling into your fingers if you tap on it. If it's really inflamed, the person jumps off the table if you do that. It's called Tunnell's test. You do it here, you do it to the median copper tunnel. We'll get into that in detail. But Midalapakanda, that's Gulfers elbow, and I'm one you're not seeing on this view would be the lateral apakanda, which is tennis elbow. Who's ever heard of tennis elbow? All tennis players do that? What about that's from no, this is from the overextending uh, of the arm as it's going from here into the cranium. It, it tears out the, the muscles and ligaments that hook into the at the, um, the right, the lateral of a condom. So you get what they call the lateral of a condom legs. Uh, if it's chronic, it becomes, now there's no more itis, osis. Osis means chronic damage to the lig ligament and tendon that arise. Oh, it never fixes itself? It never fixes itself. It can become chronic, it never go away. And it really can. Surgically, they go in the tear it and will lend it. So it's to make it better. And on the medial side, that's Gulfers elbow, because they make this swing, they overextend the arm and it hits with so much force, it over like jerks the joint and you pull on the medial of the compound. So that's Gulfers elbow. So that's when you have them in your hyperextending. Right, it's kind of hyperextending or hyper, yeah, it's, it's more hyperextending of the, of the movement at that point. Overstretching is the better way, because it's not really extending in here. This is more extending than that, okay? So it's over pronating as you're working uh, in your <laughs> It is a tendon. It is a tendon. That's what I'm thinking about. It is a tendon. It sucks. It's important. It sucks. It hurts. Yeah. But then, these are, look what you have. You have the greater and lesser tubercle, and then the intertubular sulcus, which used to be called the bicyclical groove. They changed the name, which should have stayed bicyclical groove, so you know it runs in there, biceps, tendon. Then the other thing is deltoid tuberosity, which is kind of right here, the lateral aspect of your arm, is the deltoid tuberosity. What do you think hooks into that? Deltoid. So that's the insertion point for a deltoid. Its origin is off the scapular clavicle into the arm, so it can lift the arm up. So the names kind of start making sense. If you start thinking of the muscle, thinking of what it does, it makes sense, all this stuff. So the more you learn this movement stuff, and then this thing called the coronary fossa, well, not the coronary fossa, the lacrimal fossa, rather, that really goes to coronary, because you have a coronary fossa, so coronary, that's too confusing, so we keep the coronary away. So don't worry about it. So here we can see the lateral epicondyle, which is smaller than the medial. So the medial is big, in the back there's always a big hole. That's your giveaway, that's the back of the arm. So you know, you use that as your guide by looking at the right and left humerus. And that's the electronon fossa to fit the electronon process, which is your elbow. If we go into this picture here, there it is. Well, not there. Here. There it is. That's your elbow, the electronon process. That's this. And it goes into that. So when you dislocate an elbow or fracture it, it hyperextends out or snaps across here. So it's a wonderful. You know, someone gets your arm and says, oh, you didn't see it first, I'm sorry. And there's the head of, you know, right here is the head of the radius. And here's the lacrimal of the L. So the radius, so your true hinge joint is the all the true hinge joint of the elbow is the ulna in the humerus, not the radius. The radius is the pivot joint. Okay, so your true elbow joint is the ulna and the Humerus. And we have the trochlea and we have the capitula. So the trochlea hooks up with the trochlea notch of ulna, the capitula hooks up with the radial head. So how do you remember this RC? Years ago there was a soda called Royal Crown Cola, RC Cola. So RC Cola, radius capitula, radius capitula. You just get it in your head. You need a lot of mnemonics in this course to make it. Right. You know what mnemonics are? You use the letter or something else that you kind of keep in your head of an everyday word and put it in place of the word here. I don't think you're going to recall the other word, but hopefully you will. So if you mnemonic, especially the cranial nerves, if you don't do a mnemonic, you'll never learn the 12 cranial nerves. Eventually you don't need the mnemonic, but the mnemonic helps you to keep it in your head. So just remember that, okay? 
So remember, this one makes the, the, the hinge joint of the elbow, and this one makes the root tape. So this, is, this joint here is giving you the ability to do this, and the other joint is giving you the ability to do this, okay? Just by looking at it, one's a hinge. So a trochlear looks like the thing that will wind the thread around, or at the end of a crane where the cord goes in. That's kind of what it's designed like. And it goes into the trochlear notch of the ulna. And the ulna is easy to remember because it has a new eye for ulna. You look at the side, it looks like a pipe, putting a bottle of smoke in the back of it. But it looks like a U, so U is for ulna. The radius don't shape an R, so you gotta like it. All right? And all you learn is the lecranon, trochlear notch, and styloid. When we do radius, you learn radius. Radial head, styloid. Those are the really important parts of it. The styloids are very important. Why? Because that's your wrist joint. That's what's touching the scaphoid and the lunate to create the wrist. So there we go. So that's why they're important. And years ago, in the old fashioned days, you had the cranker kind of started up, so you could fracture off. So what would happen is the person who's cranking it, the crank would catch, come around and smash the styloid of the radius and break it off. And so when you fraction a styloid, it was called a chauffeur's fraction. You don't see this stuff anymore because we don't crank cars to start them up. You know, so, those, so certain type of injuries that took place years ago, like the shovelers fraction, years ago when they were constantly shoveling the, the quay down in the south, they were extending the neck so much that the spinous processes would break off on the surface of the spine. So they call it from shoveling clay, clay shoveling fraction. That's how they get their names. So, and the same thing with they used to be belt fractures or chance fractures in the lumbar spine before they decided to put the shoulder harness all in one unit, you just had seat belts. So the car would get hit, you'd flex so hard and drive so much force through the abdomen, especially in a child, it would crack right across the vertebrae, straight across how it was out of the line from the body right through the uh, the arches into the trans into the spinal process break right across when there's a belt fracture chance. So now that cars are designed like that, you don't see that anymore. So a lot of these older type injuries don't exist. And then here again, look at the big picture of your trochlear notch and the olecranon process. Those are the two things you need. But there is U for ulna. And then showing you here a you know, palpating the styloid. You can feel them on yourself if you so choose to. And then it's showing you a, a Collie's fracture, where you fracture the distal radius and dislocate the ulna. Person falls like this and just lets go of the mesh. Burchard's fracture would be the opposite. Instead of going in the posterior plane, it goes anterior plane. So that's the sort of beauty of Then we learn in the hand, where we have eight, eight copper bones. So you only have to learn two bones, scaphoid and lumen. And the most common fractured bone in the hand is the scaphoid, because it takes out a lot of pressure and it hits. The most commonly dislocated is capitate. That's for FYI. Okay? But the two you have to learn is scaphoid and lumen in the lab. And here you just going to know eight exists. You need eight to make couples. Then we go to better couples, and we have five. And we start at the thumb as one, and we work to the pinky as number five. So if we stuck a sticky here, that'd be the metacom, right? Then we go to the phalanges, or your fingers. Now, don't these look like short bones? No? They look like short, long bones. Right, that's what they're supposed to be. These are regular shaped bones, like it used to be in nomenclature. The cobbles. The cobbles don't look like little normal bones. They look like weird shaped shapes. They're not all shaped the same. Same thing with your tassels, they're not shaped the same. They're weird looking. So they should stay in the category where they once were as irregular. Like you just can change them. So of course you keep them out of the new form. So are the carpals and phalanges short bones? Well they would be. Any of these here would be short bones. Oh, so the Any of the yeah, carpals in your board would consider to be a short bone, not all the radius. The alpha and the radius would be long bones. Sure. In the homework, I think it was the right answer was long bones. For what? For the phalanges. Oh, phalanges, long bones? Yeah. But they're really drugged up when yeah. I <laughs> wrote these questions. Yeah. Now, in the orthopedic world, they're short bones. 
they're not long bones, okay? And I would base the clinical orthopedic world over the textbook world, because that's what you see in the real world. Carl was saying, when you, even when you someday take your clinical diagnosing courses, you med surge, 90% of those don't look like what they say it does. You have to play an investigator. And that's what you do. You investigate the person's problem to figure out what's wrong with them. And you're going to dig, and you're going to dig into their history. The history the patient tells you finally will tell you what the hell's wrong with them. It's tough on a baby because babies can't talk. You don't even go by what the parents tell you. But on an adult, they can kind of tell you their history. Well, yeah, every time I wake up with sweats and pain in my back and stuff. So you probably have a lesion somewhere, maybe cancers. You know, there are a lot of lesions that exist like that. If I take aspirin, it releases. It has a sign. It could be a lesion in the bone. It could be cancerous lesion. So that stuff. But you gotta, you, you got to investigate. But in theory, these are all sharp bones. Okay, that's not me. Put that against your femurs. Look long. No. no. So that's why I tell you your homework. The grade doesn't count. Just do it. Okay, like the Nike commercial. Just do it. Don't make excuses. Just do it. Here's the thing. Just have it all done by May fifth or sixth. I think that's the end date of that of that all your homework. That's it. You've been sick, you haven't done it, fine, do it. Just get it done by the end of the semester, because that's when it's going to count. Well, you need a CD? No. Then how do you know if I remember It's online. Oh, okay. And then I get a roster from the online that sends it to me that you've done it. I don't care what your grade is, I don't care if it's a 0 out of 10, it changes color when you've opened it and done it. If it don't change color, then you didn't do it. So I can tell if you did it. If you're going to grade, it gets a lighter paint. If it's, if it's your opening, you have no grade, it's a dark paint. And if it doesn't, it stays gray, then you didn't do it at all. So I can tell if you've done your homework or if you haven't done your homework. And that's what I use to grade, to give you credit that you did it. If I don't use that as grading, it all you lousy. Because the questions are so impossible, they answer some of them. Because it's just, they just change it and change it and change it. It's just to make you think. It's a form of critical thinking to make your brain work. God's going to be right or wrong, we should be thinking about it. If you're thinking about it, you're going to get to understand it. You understand it. That's why I'm going to give it to you. It's not to torture you. But to get credit, just get it done by the end of the semester. I don't use homework in mid midterm grades are a joke. I don't know why you can do them when we have to. Okay? You can have an A in midterm, it's too fail the course. All right, here we are. So, on the phalanges, the thumb only has two. And we have three everywhere else in length, right? So we have proximal, middle, dis, uh, distant. So if I stuck a stinky right there, you would call that middle, third, famous. If we stuck a sticky here, you would say proximal, fifth, famous. A sticky here, distal, first, famous. That's how they're named, okay? So practice that in lab when you have a hand. Practice that yourself because you can't even see it. Right? So the scaphoid lunate, it's your five metacarpals, then your phalanges. What's a sesamoid bone? Delicious. Similar to a sesame, sesame seed? Delicious. It's what? Delicious. It's delicious? Chewy. So they look like tiny sesame seed sized bumps on your bones. Right. They have nothing to do with the sesame seed. <laughs> Sesamoid bones are bones that are totally encased in a ligament structure, a tendon structure, rather. totally encased in a tendon structure. And you have them here, you have them on your great toe, and you have them on your knee. And the largest of all in the body is a patella. The patella is the largest sesamoid bone in the body. You know you know that. You know you know that. It's the largest sesamoid bone. Patella. What is a sesamoid bone? Own that totally in case of a tendon sheet that protects the joint. So in other words, if you didn't have these here, there would be a big space. 
that something easily can go into the joint and damage it. So when something hits the joint, what that does is it actually will cover the joint and protect it. So that's why you have it. Okay? It's to protect the joint. Just like your knee. You'd have a big opening right into the knee joint if you didn't have that bone overlying it. So if it fell on your knee, you would damage inside the joint, the joint capsule. And that kind of takes up the slack to prevent that from happening. So that's why you have it. All right? So what's the proper name of a, of a bone? Palus. The palus. Right? That's what you were saying, right? What's that? Palus. 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 There's the palus. Palus. And how about the toe? The great toe. Palus. 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 Somebody told me, Polar. I said, no, it's not from, my, your thumb's not from Polar. It's not from Polar. <laughs> Palaces. They pronounce the Polar. Pol Polarcus. I said, really? So you go for that Polar. Yes. <laughs> She's Polar. <laughs> but no, no, no. Palaces. The reason I say it, when you start reading some of the muscles in the floor, on you see extensive palaces, brevis, that's a palaces longest, the ductus palaces longest. So you're going to see these things, how, you know, halluses, extensive halluses, longest, extensive halluses, brevis. You know what the hell it's talking about. You're talking about your big toe or your thumb. Okay? So that's the reason why I'm mentioning this to you. And this are you pretty the median nerve is So let's go to our pelvic bone. So the, the easiest way to see it where these three things will merge, they merge inside the acetabulum. So that cavity that holds the head of the femur is the acetabulum. Remember what that stands for, acetabulum? No, about Tina, you remember what that stands for, acetabulum? Acetabuli. Yeah. Little source of vinegar. <coughs> Little source of vinegar. Why? Maybe because of acetic acid. I don't know. That's what vinegar is made out of. Who knows? That's what the term means. Little source of vinegar. So you can dip it in. So you can put some of this pelvis on the table and use it for a little dipping. <laughs> like a fondue. <laughs> but that, that's what the term means. That's what it means. Don't ask me. I didn't. Listen. So in the front, we have the pubic bone. In the back, we have. The issue, and I'll show you in lab that if you can hold it in your right hand, and my thumb can tuck under the ischial spine, and it's a right one. I put it in my left hand, and my thumb tucks under the left perfectly, it's a left. So it's so easy to know if I'm looking at it right or left. Because if I hold it in my hand, and my thumb's nowhere near the spine, that means it doesn't belong in that hand, so it's not right. It'd be a left. You follow what I'm saying? I'll show you that in lab tomorrow. Now, I'm saying that for the other drug, right, Professor Royal, pick it up. If the spine touches your thumb, then it's a right. If it's my left hand only and that spine is touching my left thumb, it's a left. It's the easiest way to know what thing you're looking at. All right? It's very easy to figure it out, right or left. See, this analogy I can give them, whether they're just looking at it and know. It'll take time, you'll get there. But it takes time in the beginning. Just pick it up and know it's a right versus a left. You sit on this, the issue of tuberosity. So if I ask you a question, when you're sitting, you part of the pelvic bone is touching the chair, it's the issue of tuberosity. And yes, you can get a bursitis there. So you can't sit. You gotta kind of sit sideways. It's just weird you got to get instead of there. It's just not the same. <laughs> it's quiet. It's quiet, I know. He's, he's quiet back there. It's like he's not here today. He's here in spirit. Okay, so this, those are the key points on this. We'll go to the public stuff in the lab. It's easier that way. And again, showing you like your cross section. You get that strong issues, issue of sacral ligaments, the very strong ligaments off the spine of your. Of your um, issue of heart. But, you know, you gotta remember, it's gonna come down through here is like parts of the sciatic nerve. So if you're in spasm, you're affecting this structure too. So this tightness through here can create sciatica. It doesn't have to always be a disc. Sacral iliac reason to create sciatica. OK? 
Okay? It's a singular, and what's happening when you go singular out, the thing further goes into distortion. There's your patella. Yay, you don't need to know it all the parts, you just go patella. It is the largest decimal. Yes, it is. Now we go to our femur. Femur has a head, a neck, but instead of tubercles, that's greater in <coughs> the trochanters, because they're bigger than a tubercle. And they're kind of jagged. And then you just learn condyles, which is a round, smooth surface. Not every condyle is a condyles, which you're going to touch the knee. You know, the patella surface. And in the back, the linear sparrow, which is the jagged line. That goes on the back of the feet. The female always has a tendency to go forward when it's in its right plane. So that would be, you know, it's laying there. And usually on a practice, I have it sitting, laying there as if you were sitting looking at your own leg. But somehow you get to pick it up and mess yourself up. So just walk up to it and say, okay, it's the right feet. What's the left feet? It's just like looking at your leg. You sit down looking at that's a right and that's a left. You know, you don't have to pick your leg up and look at it to figure out if the right or left. I try to position it for you that it's in place, but that doesn't work. Then we have tibia and fibula. The tibia is the real true weight-bearing bone. And we have this membrane between, you saw that in the upper the forearm, and you saw that, now you're seeing it called the interosseous membrane. And they feel when you get shin splints, that's where the tears are taking place. They're taking place right here, where it's meeting your shin bone, which is the, which one's the shin bone? The tibia or the fibula, the tibia, right? So they feel it kind of tears away from the bone if they close, if it's really stressed. Because you're not running properly with the shoe you have on, and it's causing too much shear force, and it tears. So they think a lot of interosseous membrane tears, why you get these deep, Shins that don't clear up. So the proper shoe running on the right surface doesn't make a difference. You know, if you're going to run, you should get rid of your shoes every couple of months if you're a true 10 mile a day runner. Professor, is that what, is that what Oshkut Slaughter is? No, we're going to talk about Oshkut Slaughter. <laughs> now that you mention it, who's heard of Oshkut Slaughter's disease? Well, we know Tina has. Anybody else? Well, that's my good friend Oscar. <laughs> she Oscar had a slaughter problem, so he called Oscar. No, the two people, Oscar and Slaughter, figured it out. And what it is, see this thing called the tibial tuberosity? Which I know you do, so if we go here into a bigger picture of it. The tibial tuberosity, you know how we say we have an ep epiphysis, a diaphysis? You also have a metaphysis, which we didn't learn about. It's like the dead space between the two. But you also have an apophysis, apophysis, and that's this, and that's a secondary attachment site. And what will happen? This would have a, you know, so it would have a cartilaginous plate behind it, opening this to the bone. But in a child, if I'm playing like sports, that there's a lot of pivoting, such as soccer, basketball, and so on. they're always pivoting on their feet quickly, quick run motions, and stop and pivot. A lot of torsion takes place. It starts to evolve the way. And also, you have this big bump below their knee, and it hurts like hell. That's Oscar Slaughter's disease. So, you'll see a child running around, it looks like a rubber band around their leg. That's an Oscar Slaughter support to hold it in place. Usually, you've got to take them out of the sport for three to six months to let the thing heal, cut down the inflammation, then you put the support, and they're going to play with that forever. Support. Um, because if not, it'll heal with deformity with this big, ugly knee. Which isn't good if you want to be Victoria's Secret models. We know that's been your dream. <laughs> <laughs> I gave the secret away. That's what Victoria's Secret is. He owns the company. <laughs> well, that is the secret. It's all about the man and the woman. You have to work for the man. Victoria people's work, I'll tell you, that's the secret. So I call Victoria's secret. It's not Victoria's secret. It's a guy. Yeah. And it's only, you know, and only a guy would hire all pretty models, right? <laughs> it's a guy thing. But in theory, they're too skinny. So they're really not to be attractive in the real world. And, you know, when they're thighs smaller than my upper arm, it's like. <laughs> 
throw out one of the skeletons from the lab. Unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> they ditched that as normal. That's not normal in the United States. Females five nine and weighs 90 pounds. That's not a normal female. But what I want you to also notice on, on these bones that are important structures, your medial lateral malleoli, because those form the ankle joint. So on this guy here, the fibula, it's kind of shaped like a bow and arrow, Cupid's arrow, where the head of it, which is up at the top, is flat, and the lateral malleolus is kind of pointy. So, you know, if you put it in a bow and shoot it. Imagine that. Pissed you off so much, you took his fibula out and stabbed him with it to his arm. I don't know to see that be, right? Big cut leg plus the heart, the arrow. So it's kind of shaped, that's how you know, am I looking at the lateral malleolus or am I looking at its head? The head would be flat. So there's a zombie going out and walk down, I'm sorry. It's supposed to be a really good walk there, so I've seen a great zombie going with the steps. That's pretty cool. See? Awesome. I don't know, sort of, I stole my idea. But they're going to use that bone, that bone is perfect. And the medial malleoli. So what we're going to see here, if we go down into this section, we're going to fracture both malleoli. To see this type fracture, you know, where your root unfolds off that medial malleoli, this person probably fell with an eversion where the foot hit and twisted up, and it's going to snap. You roll the foot in, yeah, you can fracture that lateral, but in theory, you're going to tear out ligament structure first. In this case, the medial ligaments that support your ankle, known as the deltoid ligament, that will not tear. That will just rip the bone right off, and that's what's probably happening. This person came in and got hit this way, and snapped right across. That's fractured there, and it's fractured here. Nice, nasty fracture. Okay? So it doesn't look like that younger. The broke plates are closed. If you don't see it over here, it looks like it's closed. Yes, they're very unstable. A lot of times they're going to pin them, especially the lap, the medial, that would have to be pinned. Yeah. Pinned back. And then you, do, you know, more weight bearing for at least three to four weeks before you start putting weight on it. You do. You do. Most ankle fractures have to get pinned. Because it's very unstable when you fracture. You've torn ligaments and so forth, and it's just nasty. Is a break like almost better as far as like healing? The bit of well. A fracture. Is a fracture a break? Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. How does sometimes if you like fracture or something? Depends where it is, where there's not a lot of movement to it, you don't need to cast. It depends how bad, how deep the fracture goes. If it was a heel line, then you don't really need to cast it. You know, but if it's here, my God, they don't cast that thing. The person will want to walk it. I mean, it will heal with deformity, but that ankle is going to probably fuse itself eventually. So you do, you all screw up. That's nasty. Look at that. It's like, ouch. Then you look at the arch. Let's go show you a picture of the arch. Well, all you learn from going through the foot, I just tear this and calcaneus. That's it. I don't go into all the foot. But just know you have seven tassels and you have eight cartels. Okay? You're not becoming a podiatrist. Don't worry about it. You know, and you have the same thing, metatarsals, phalanges. But we don't go into the name of the phalanges and so forth that we do with the right, So if we look at the next picture, show you how important the arch is. And when you get this all screwed up, when you start losing your arch, forming the arches, you get plantar fasciitis. Which is, because this is a thick tissue on here, really thick. That plantar fascia is thick as hell. And it doesn't have a lot of stretch to it. So what's happening to that plantar fascia as the arch is coming out, it starts to stretch, tear, it's inflamed. So the only way the body can heal against it is to stop producing a spur to come out over here. So eventually you will form a heel spur. You're also going to get spurs coming up this way in the Achilles too. Yeah, what is that? What is that called? I'll tell you. Right. So that's a good question which she asked. What is it caused by? What is caused by? We can't, the body can't really lengthen that, that ligament structure. So what it does, it starts tractioning the bone. So you actually start taking the bone and calcifying it out. It's known as a traction spur. Not a stabilizing spur, a traction spur. So what will happen is, 
where that tendon is meeting the bone is tearing. Instead of forming new tendon tissue, the bone starts to calcify the tissue. So a spur forms. And the spur can start impinging into other structures near it, and that's what creates the pain that they go in and clean it up. You know, usually plant out, one way to treat a plant out fasciitis is you, you got a, a hard ball, like a golf ball or something, and have them roll their foot over. Break up, break up the adhesions in the, in the ultrasound. They, Put a foot on that oh, again so there. Water right. Rolling. Yeah, something right. Just to break it up and numb it. That don't work, then they cortisone it. That don't work, then they go in surgery and clean it. But it's usually not the spur causing the problem, it's the plant of fashion. Doctors are good at treating you if your arm's hanging off. You know, you got a big guy, you got a big gash in your neck. Good to figure out what's wrong with you right away.
there was no different treating in 50 years later. It's a non-hormonal chemo, so it's called a non-hormonal uh, cancer, so it's triple negative. You get three hormonal type, one not. That's why it's called triple negative cancer. It's the most deadliest form of breast cancer. They can't cure it. They can't arrest it. They can't do anything to it. They can slow it a little bit, but that's it. But eventually it'll win. Another way they're gonna fix it someday is who? The gene therapy. That's the future of cancer. And that's what the A guy was saying. For 40 years we failed you. We've targeted, cut it, chemo. Because we're not looking for way to treat the disease. Few do respond to that, but in general that wasn't the way to treat it. The, the, the treatment was almost, the cure almost killed the patient. Think about it. Almost everybody throwing on heavy doses of chemo, what they come about? Aplastic anemia, the immune su insufficient. Come on. So if they pick up a virus, they're dead. You know, so there's when you got to think about that. We really have screwed up on a lot of things. We 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 figured out a better way to diagnose stuff, but we haven't made it better. So that's attraction spur. And when we get into joints and movement and stuff, we're going to go to the next lecture. I'm not going to jump into that today with you. We'll get into the different types of arthritis and rheumatoid versus osteo, and why you get a spur formation. And it's almost the same thing again. Those are not they're different types of spurs. It's the same thing. It's the way the body stabilizes itself. Because think of an elastic band. Now, in this case, it's being stretched. It's a traction spur. The spur you see on joints that are, that are damaged is the elastic band no longer has its elasticity because it's overstretched. So how do I make it tight again? I calcify it. And that's why you see the spurs falling in the direction they go. Back, the same, thing, same thing with the Achilles. Why does that happen? I have those, and I have no idea where they came from. Somewhere along the line, you damaged the Achilles and you did that. So that means it's very easy for you to can rupture the Achilles. If the Achilles is probably short. Just be careful. My boyfriend has Achilles, the only reason yeah. I have them is he discovered the one I was like, yeah. Right, so if you do an x-ray, you'll see them. Really? They're actually bones, huh? Mm. They'll show up. Maybe they have a fall. Alrighty, so that's it for today. I'm not going to keep you here any longer. Um, so in the next class, we're going to get into the classification of the damage done.